The really nice thing is I've got a really good co-presenter, some guy named Matt. So um, how many people have heard the term foundry, know what a foundry is? Yeah, okay, pretty good. Now I should clarify, um, foundry is a term that's used for someone that makes semiconductors. Uh, foundries can sometimes be used as a term for a collaborative environment. And foundries even sometimes are a bar in certain cities. So my foundry, although I do like that last one, um, is a place that takes liquid metal, pours it into a mold to make a casting. So the question was raised at the start of today, where should Ross go in the next 10 years? My vision would be that we want Ross to drive freeform robotics. What do I mean by freeform robotics? Well, I do operations on a casting that aren't always the same. And we'll be talking about specifically grinding. And in the case of grinding, one casting is going to differ from another casting. That's pretty straightforward, right? Different parts going to be a different part. But sometimes the grinding operation specific to casting of the same part vary, right? If I make a different part, maybe it has different features or different amounts of grinding that need to be done. But I'd really like the robot to have AI that drives what it does. I don't think that there's actual intelligence. I don't think the robot's gonna sit there and say, boy, if I'm a person, I would say, well, how, how do I access that point? That the robot can do, right? That's just a quick analytics. That's what AI is really capable of is analytics. So if we take that information, the robot can go up and say, hey, I can access this point. It can also start to collect data. And with that data, it can say, if I go in this way versus that way, I was twice as fast. Or if I remove this feature versus that feature, I was twice as fast. And eventually it will go through an optimization protocol, but it's because of data. It's not that it's really thought these things through. It's just using smart analytics. So I'd love to see Ross be able to couple those things together so that when a casting is presented to it, it can say, hey, I think this thing is something I need to remove. I've got these tools, literal tools, that I can use to remove those, and it can pick and figure out the best way of doing that. So that freeform robotics would be really cool. So let's talk a little bit about our industry. So as Matt mentioned, I'm from Steel Founders Society. So we've been around since 1902. Our organization started for price fixing. And yes, that was before antitrust came about. Antitrust didn't happen too far after that. So we had to figure out a new cause in life. Quickly, we got involved in specifications. So like ASTM in the 1920s, because we realized that we as an industry need a common way of interacting with customers. After that, getting into the 1930s, we said, boy, we make castings, and wouldn't it be nice to see what's inside those castings so we know it's going to perform? So with that, we investigated this newfangled technology called X-ray. From there, quickly going into World War II, we continued our technology development, and we've collaborated to quite a bit of an extent on through today with the DOD. Our members strictly make steel castings. So we don't have any suppliers, we don't have any customers, it's just steel foundries. The nice thing about it is with that kind of small group, it offers an opportunity for collaboration. So looking at our world of steel castings, it's not the big steel mill industry that's out there. We're only a fraction of that size. So we make the liquid steel in the same fashion, but we pour it into a mold to get complex geometry or shapes. So let's talk just a little bit about what that process entails. So if you look at a very simple flanged elbow, right, it's got this hollow geometry. And if you can develop a right angle tool bit, you'll make a lot of money. But in the meantime, this is a really nice part to make as a casting because we can create that internal geometry with the liquid steel. So we've got to have some way of um, pouring that liquid steel into something to create the shape. That's called a mold. Uh, these days, you can actually use additive manufacturing to create the mold. Traditionally, you would have a pattern or a tool for processing that. You have to put all of those pieces together so that you've got an internal cavity that represents the final shape that you want to produce. You also have to have a plumbing system. 
So we got to have some way of getting the liquid metal into the mold. And then as the liquid solidifies, it's going to want to shrink. So we got to be able to feed that shrink unless that amount of shrink is acceptable to the customer. So assembling that mold together, we pour the liquid metal into there, and now all of a sudden we got a casting. Well, sort of. It's not ready to be shipped to the customer because it has that plumbing system attached to it. Maybe there's some items with inside the casting that need to be processed and things like machining and so forth to make the finished item. But the biggest first step is to take that rigging system, the plumbing, off of the casting. So in my world, again, that's steel. So it has all the properties of steel. So trying to do things like break it off, steel doesn't just snap. Uh, trying to do things like machine it off is expensive. I'm just interested in getting it off fast so I can process the casting for the customer. So we do a lot of grinding on steel castings. We do grinding because that plumbing system, once it's cut off, and usually the cutoff will be with a torch, with arc air, or with a cutoff wheel, but you still end up with a little nub that's on the casting. That then you grind down so it meets the casting surface. Where the two halves of the mold come together, sometimes some of the steel with hydrostatic pressure gets into that parting line and there's a little bit of flash. So in general, we'll grind off that flash. If the surface is too rough, we can grind the surface. Now, traditionally an as cast surface doesn't interfere with performance, but if there's a preference for aesthetics, then it can be further processed. For welding, so there we're grinding into the casting to remove something and then we're welding it. And then finally, once the part's been heat treated, the scale that's been developed. So what is a casting surface? Why is it not perfectly smooth? Well, most of our molds, most common method is sand. That's what we make it out of. So it captures that surface of the sand. It has that, that roughness to it. It can also be made with an investment casting process that's a little bit smoother. It's a ceramic shell that the liquid metal comes up against. But that casting surface is what we want to make certain passes the requirements of the customer. So right now we use comparator plates. So they're tactile comparator plates. You can feel the plates, you can see the plates and the inspector says, yes, it looks like this. It's no worse than that. That's what the comparison is made from. Iowa State's done some technology development where we're actually able to start to scan some of these surfaces to make that evaluation. So what do we need to do? We're job shops. We make onesie twosies, maybe 10, maybe 100. Steel foundries are not high production. We're not automotive. So it is absolutely a showstopper to do part-specific programming and fixturing. Can't be done. So we need some way of taking the processes that are needed to manufacture castings and automate them. Most of the steel foundries that are out there are true small and medium-sized enterprises. And since they're job shops, that means they're the buzzword of high mix, low volume. Trick is everyone talks about trying to provide solutions. I walk around the entire show floor, it's a big show floor. I don't see anyone providing those solutions. Maybe you can hire someone, identify an integrator, work on a specific narrow niche, but I don't have a solution for my industry as a whole. And beyond my industry, there's also guys that make aluminum castings. There's people that make steel forging. So there's job shop manufacturing that occurs all over the place or a conversation from last night talking about painting in small areas while well, utilizing robotics to do spray quenching of castings would be a really neat opportunity. Figuring out how to grab a casting and lift it up. As you might imagine, it's steel, so it doesn't take much size for it to become very heavy. So how do we start to automate these things? But again, it's gotta be that, that free form, the capability to just grab everything, not to have a part specific program or tool fixture. We're also very interested in non-destructive testing. So we wanna have better quantification versus currently today, everything's very much so workmanship standards. So advancing that technology and a lot of that refinement comes from taking the person out of it to improve the gauge R&R, repeatability, reproducibility. 
So solutions that can handle variability is really key to this kind of freeform robotics. So what do I mean by that? So a casting number one can vary in terms of size. Again, one casting to the next, even though it's the same part number. But in addition to that, we might have process variability, what needs to actually be done to a specific part. Um, but we also, in using things such as grinding, it's not like CNC machining, right? If I run a mill across something, number one, I probably have it in a fixture. I probably have a program. I already said you can't do that. Um, but I also know how much material is going to be removed. When I grind on something, I don't know exactly how much material is going to be used. I can use force compliance to make certain that I'm applying a load to an area. That's great and important but I really don't know what the end result is. So I have to have kind of this adaptive automation. I have to see what was done and then keep iterating on that. That's something that's really important. So our project that we're working right now is to try to solve a grinding solution, a challenge, right? Um, workforce challenges exist everywhere. Our challenge is these jobs such as grinding are extremely difficult to find people. The traditional artisan jobs are not of interest. And it's not a pay thing, they're just not of interest. So how do we start to tackle things such as this? A person is really good at recognizing what needs to be done, doing kind of that free form adaptation, but the robot doesn't get tired, doesn't mind lifting something continually. So it's really great. So how do we start to blend those together? Well, with Iowa State, they've identified something. And I think that this is absolutely unique. I haven't seen anything like it come out otherwise in industry. Tell me if I'm wrong. But what they've done is they've taken the operator to actually drive what the robot does. So how do you do that? How do you do that where you're not always programming everything? It's a really neat thing, right? You got a surface. In our case, it's steel. There's something that's a positive, comes out of the part. Well, if I want to remove that, I just circle it. That tells the robot that that's the thing that needs to be removed. So how much do I remove it? How do I monitor that process? Well, I make another circle. Between those two circles, it can now identify the underlying surface. Castings are complex shapes. So it's never going to be matching something down to a flat surface. You need to fit it. So the neat thing about it is you make those two circles, it now has identified what to remove and what to match it to. And the operator then, as those castings vary, can pick and choose different things on different parts. Doesn't have to program it. And the nice thing also about the programming is it's smart grinding. So it's gonna scan then the thing that needs to be removed. And if it exists up here, but not down here, it's going to start grinding over here. It's not going to spend time grinding in error. That's always one of the challenges when you set up a, a, a tool path, right? So this innovation really is, is going to help to empower us to process steel castings in a true job shop nature. So an example here, some of the early development work that was done. So these were printed examples that you see on the upper left-hand side. So they've got some positive, something that comes on of the, the, the surface of the part. And as you can see, all they did was circle what needs to be removed. And then there's another um, circle around the edge of the part. So again, you're able to identify where the underlying surface is. It's scanned. It takes on of that scan, of course, the protrusion, because you don't want to count that in your entire surface. And then it sets up its grinding path and blends it down to the surface. So now it's time to really make this happen. Make sure that something doesn't die in the R&D valley of death, right? You know, very great to see it um, do something on plastic, but let's really get it out to the foundry where we'll find out that there's additional challenges to overcome. So our partners in this, of course, are, are Sweary, Iowa State, and then the foundry we're collaborating with is uh, Fisher Castile inside of Columbus, Ohio. And then, of course, with the help of Push Corp and Yaskawa, we now are putting together this system so that it can be used on steel castings. So I'll say we did an alpha trial, uh, I mean, at Push Corp uh, a little over a month ago. 
and we had the foundry make some test casting so shipping a casting for the way that the casting didn't seem to make sense but if we've got some features that are on there that represent for instance what i'd say is a riser pad or the sacrificial lamb to feed the casting those get cut off but again we've got a machine or grind really that nub down to the surface of the casting so in this case it is um, a flat surface in most of these but just for the experimental testing this was an easy way to prove out with a lot of replication you can see all those six circular uh, features on this piece of steel those were to be ground off so I'll turn it over to Matt, talk a little bit about our cell. We've got two sides to the cell. So one's a freeform side. In the case of a casting, it again, being steel, if it's big, the good news is we don't need fixturing to hold it in place. And of course, usually we can't fixture things. So it can go inside B or the right-hand side. And then on the other side, we've got a manipulator so that again, the robot doesn't have to figure out how to twist. We can get the part in the right shape to the robot. Yeah, exactly, right? So you may have saw, you may recall this morning, right? So Michael shared some updates about Scan and Plan Workshop. He's touched a little bit on this. And this is a really interesting use case, right? This idea of I'm just gonna throw it on the floor and do the work, right? Obviously on the positioner side, it's generally pretty good, like located, but this is a little bit different different um, approach, right? So um, we're really excited. Actually the layouts in our inbox is to approve today, right? The official layout. But I, I'd like to highlight a touch a few things here, right? So Michael's also talked about is taking the opportunity of ROS2, right? So obviously we've gotten lots of questions. I was on the floor. I'm sure Kat gets them all the two and Dave gets them, I'm sure, about like, hey, this ROS2 transition, like, why is it so painful? When should I do it? Should I do it? Can I just keep building ROS1 from source, right? I mean, you can do these things, right? But this is an opportunity, right? So as Michael alluded to, we're revisiting a lot of the uh, core packages and repositories and thinking about how to re-architect them, right, to make them more extensible. So here we're going to go to Foundry 1, right, and it already has a lot going on. Dave actually kind of glossed over the fact that there's actually a little bit of a behavior difference between the stainless steel and the carbon steel, and both are in scope, right? So we'll have to actually have a way to represent those processes. Unfortunately, we have some experience in that. Right, but we need to like, we'll probably have some way to like make sure we pick the right process if it's stainless or carbon steel. Um, so that's like one of those little details, but how do we architect the solution to kind of handle those variations? How do you interact with the operator? And then of course, I'm working with David here and he doesn't just have this one foundry, he has a number of foundries. And the idea here is we can create a core application built on a teaching workshop that we train people on that can be extended and molded into the other foundries within his organization and beyond, right? So that's what we're really excited about. Uh, Michael showed some screenshots uh, of, of the progress and how we're incorporating the best practices. So he noted like, for instance, the ability to, hey, I, don't just execute the tool path, right? It needs to have the appropriate processing angles, right? And how we, do we manage the approaches and departures? And some of that's through some really hard learning and how sensitive approaches departures are in other applications. But those are sort of the, some of the things and the collaboration now, another thing that's really exciting is he mentions Iowa State's work, right? So organizations, like when I was at Caterpillar, we funded, how many times we funded university projects, we'd get the output and then it's like, it just kind of sits in a report, right? Or sits on a share drive, right? Or a SharePoint site or whatever your flavor is. So here, what we're really hoping to do is leave a working functioning system in, at Iowa State. So as they develop new capability with their collaboration partners, they can actually put it into something. Hopefully we can help guide them and how to architect solutions so they can be brought in, right? And it's a little bit like, there's a little bit of a ringing kind of like synergy here with like what Christoph shared, the open RMF work that our friends at Asia Pacific have done, the work Dave is doing with Space Ross to make things reusable and architected in a way that can be brought in that's exactly the spirit of this project to enable our university friends to do great, tangible industrial work. And how do we get that into the factories, right? And then, of course, have like good starting points that are available and accessible that the integrator community wants to actually work with them. So today, a big gap for us, as Dave's alluded to, a lot of integrators are like, yeah, open source. A little bit like Sean talked about, you're going to put open source in the factory. They're still just uneasy because it is a different skill set. And then Dave alluded to it, right? Not everyone wants to have a bunch of senior software developers, right? And integrators definitely do not, right? PLC programmers, yeah. Like teach pen programmers, yes. But some integrators have been 
little nervous about like, hey, I can hire this master's degree in robotics, but how do I keep them busy when we don't have the fancy project, right? And so obviously our friends from Aerobotics shared their experience and how they're ramping up incorporating ROS enabled capabilities in their projects. And it is a little bit different, like the talent pipeline, like our friends from AP talked about helping members maintain the talent pipeline. We're hoping that we get some benefit of that in our collaboration with ISU as well. So those are sort of some of the broad themes and why this is important to the consortium and open source more broadly and making an impact in industry. So that's my two cents. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. Thank you. So there's obviously a, a little bit of work that needs to be done, you know, yet still. And uh, so it's been great working with Swiri and they're going to be headed up to Iowa State real quick here. Uh, so, so to start working on having that kind of clone available. And as Matt said, the nice thing about that is if there's, and we know there's going to be additional development work, right? You know, our thrust is to start to get this own into industry because we'll learn what shortcomings there are. We'll learn where we want to identify additional applications for it. And then we can bring those back to whether it's Swiri or Iowa State and work on that development while we're also into production in maybe some limited fashion. So that's what really makes this opportunity nice. I'm excited to kind of see it uh, come together. As Matt knows, uh, I've been pestering, you know, how can we get this into a foundry? We had that two-year COVID blip that kind of happened. And if we take that aside, this has really moved out pretty fast. So uh, we started discussions probably back last fall, trying to really build the team, make sure we had a, a way to go forward. And this August is when it's supposed to, to hit the foundry. So that's a pretty quick time frame to go from innovation, right? Trying to take the, the research and actually get it applied in a true center with inside the foundry. So we will have to sort out some things. And again, this is some of the development that continue to progress is, you know, how do we end up manipulating the part? What's the best way to do that? Um, having a, a universal way to put it into the manipulator so that it can handle the orientation effects. But one big thing is grinding media, grinding media that's matched to a robot. So a robot, right, can apply more force than a person, can really spin at some pretty fast speeds on spindles. So how do we make certain that if it's a stone, it doesn't blow up? Because if it blows up, that's not only going to put a lot of wear and tear on the spindle and the robot itself, but it also potentially becomes a safety concern. So do we do some development and do fiber reinforcement for some stones? Or do we go with the route of a disc? The challenge to a disc though is access points. So if you got something big that's spinning, it makes it a little bit harder to get into things. So that's the give and take. And again, we don't have to solve all of it at once. If we get a 5% solution, that's okay. It's better than the 0% solution that we have today. Are foundries interested in this? Yeah, there's three of them that are in the room. Foundries, again, are small and medium-sized enterprises, so none of them are going to buy 50 robots all at once. But they, as an industry, are very interested in this, and together that makes for some big numbers. And like I say, it goes beyond just steel foundries into other metal casting and then into other manufacturing of metal, such as forging. So we really got a big opportunity with this application, we want to clone it. This grinding is needed by basically any steel foundry that's out there. And we want to continue to advance it. So that's really our, our next and I'll say our near short term effect. Some other projects to mention, we've worked with EWI to develop a tele-operated Arc Air. So Arc Air is a fast and efficient way to remove steel, to cut through steel. But it is a noisy and I'll say hot heavy job that requires a lot of safety equipment. So bringing the person outside to control the operation holds a lot of opportunity. So having it teleoperated allows for that to happen. And it's kind of a first step towards that kind of automation. We'd love to have lights out manufacturing. Like I say, the complete free form where the robot can go in, can grab a part, figure out what needs to be done, process it, optimize on that processing. But I'm happy to take baby steps. The other process that we worked on is torch cutting. 
So this is another way of, again, getting through steel fast and the automation of that process. Here was one that we thought was going to require adaptive automation. So if you hit porosity or some uh, air pocket with inside the, the casting, we were concerned that the torch would come back, the flame would come back. Obviously, if the flame comes back, there's not a person it's coming back to, but having that response, that mechanism of knowing what to do so you don't torch your robot is really important. The nice thing is that we found out that with the right torch and plenty of oxygen, you don't have that problem. The other thing is sometimes some of the sand from the mold will stick to the casting. And likewise, right torch, plenty of oxygen. You don't have to worry about that. We thought we we're going to need to have a flexible program that could adapt to the situation if it encountered some sand and we're able to get past that. So where do we want to go in the future? There's a lot of research that we're doing right now in Industry 4.0. And it ranges from doing automated image analysis, right? You know, and to a certain extent, that's not automation, but it's really important to enable the automation, that processing, right? That sensor technology, knowing what to do, what to interrogate, how to process it. We're also developing technology that's wearable technology. So there's still going to be artisans with inside the manufacturing environment. How do we equip those artisans with smart glasses so that it can give them work instruction or do on-job training? So if someone taught me how to do something, but I don't use it for a month, am I going to go ask my supervisor, how do I do that again? Well, maybe not. I don't want to be embarrassed saying I forgot how to do something. But if I scrap the casting, well, guess what? That's pretty embarrassing. So if I can pull open training video on what I'm supposed to do right there in front of me when I'm working on the part, that's pretty neat. If I can do voice to text instead of writing down what my dimensions are and then going to fat finger it in, why do I have someone that's really good at making a casting, spending time doing administrative work, logging information, writing, writing it down once and then keying it in? Guess how many times the numbers get messed up? So if I can just voice record that information, that becomes really powerful. So, so many opportunities that are out there. Um, deep learning, right? Now, that's a question that I just fired off this morning. Smart glasses usually have a camera. They also do eye tracking. Why can't we see what the inspector's looking at? Where do they identify what problems are? Then take that information and tell the inspector, hey, look over here. I think that's something. And then that develops that learning algorithm that hopefully then allows it to be automated. We're also doing a bunch of automation in terms of the processing for making casting, everything from the front end where we make the mold on through the final finishing. There's a ton of automation opportunity. Let me just tell you that. So with that said, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time and appreciate anyone that wants to help pile in and join our team. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we're pretty we're pretty good on schedule. Are there any questions for David? Yes, Aaron. Thank you for the presentation. You know, for the ASC International. So also thank you for being one of our two thousand groups way back. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. A lot of what you're doing sort of plays back to what the standards that you mentioned earlier on. Yes. Is there actually, should ASC and other standards organizations actually sort of help with some of those minimum processes you might be able to talk about something like break and go too fast? Is this like all those projects put up that could be done research into standardization that would help speed this up? And I'm just wondering, is, is that, are you seeing that, that you know what your final product should be based on the standards? Should now we make the processes a standard to save clients, but also give guidance to this room of what they build? Sure, that's that's a great question. Is Adam? I think it was Adam in the room. Okay, um, I had an interesting conversation with him at dinner last night, and. Um, and I'll say, I, I think so. Obviously, it's still a lot of evolution that needs to, to happen. But I think not only knowing what needs to be done, but how to do it. So your question of should there be a standard for a process? I'll say, I, I, I think so. Right? It certainly seems like there could be an opportunity. 
So that would be something good for us to make sure we put in the back of our minds that as this starts to evolve, what's a logical way for doing those things? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So there's been a lot of interesting work on standards and we, we tend not to use the term standard, but we have come across on the different industrial domains or in robotics, like the templates, if you will, that could potentially become standards, right? For how do we actually incorporate this automated process to do something that impacts the materials? So obviously I, I encountered this in welding and we replicated a lot of these templates. Our friend here from formerly World Robotics and Lincoln Automation had a really nice table set up for grinding that we collaborated with them on years ago. Um, so those, those sorts of things could be good starting points for a conversation around standards, but obviously we need a lot more involvement with the other stakeholders, like for instance, the people who have concern about the materials. What's interesting, really exciting about working with David's group, it's like, not only do we like get to get together with his group and talk about robots, but then all of a sudden the materials are creating, right? And there is sometimes, particularly like if you're working with thermal mechanical processes, there's a real interplay. You might do your automation different, Right, because because there's an interplay or a chance you maybe even optimize material performance and service. So that's actually a general science welding person by background. That's how I got into it. Right, because we knew we could influence the performance and service through leverage of automation. Right, so there's a little bit of that opportunity here, and that's for definitely a standard play. If there is a real tight, you're getting in spades and in, uh, avid of manual, but they are tightly coupled. Right, so is that uh, probably obviously that in certain cases uh, that opportunity. Right. You start talking about quenching, right? You're directly using a process to influence material properties. So, yeah, that's definitely something to kind of keep on the radar. In my opinion. Any other questions for David and the world of foundries? Yes, Joseph. Um, I have a question about probably not a very interested in steel as advantages manufactured out yeah, uh, great question. Um, so far, the, the additive guys really have been, I'll say, mirroring. One of the nice things about casting is you're kind of boutique metal manufacturing. So we make things in small batches. We can tweak a chemistry, unlike a mill that has to produce, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of steel, we can do small batches. So additive is a little bit more limited, right? Because you've got to have the metal shot and there's only a few flavors out there that are made. There's only a couple, of, at least in the US, a couple of producers of the shot, like a carpenter. Um, but to answer your question, no, there's really no difference in those. There can be a difference sometimes when you cast an alloy and that it might be tweaked. And those tweaks can do things such as castings are commonly used with raw product. So how do we make sure and it has the same performance if we're not working it? So similar mechanical properties, similar corrosion resistance. And to improve things such as castability, sometimes silicon will be a little bit higher. But in general, uh, 8630 steel that's made as a casting is an 8630 that would be the shot for making additive, would be the 8630 that's a forging, would be the 8630 mill product that's machine welded and so forth. It's the same steel. Matt, may I add a little bit there? Mm -hmm. So obviously over the, oh yeah, sorry. So yes, hello online audience, sorry about that. So over the last, like obviously 15, 20 years, right? There was a real big push around that actually helped even accelerate additive manufacturing around the topology optimization movement for design of structures, right? I think one thing that, that we miss is like, okay, like what does the advancement of automation now mean? So I can do topology optimization and create a really odd looking designed thing that, that casting lends itself to, right? You can pour about anything you can make a mold for, yeah. right? But obviously in the future state with additive manufacturing, you can imagine now an uh, not just topology optimized, but some sort of optimized value stream that includes robotics and the different processes and how they're used, right? So we're seeing more and more, and obviously the work at Ohio State around Hammer, right? There's a little bit more of this fusion, right? Like, hey, there still is a place for forging, right? When I Before I came to Southwest Research Institute, everyone was thinking like, oh, finally, I can get these forgings out because every time I buy a forging, I need to buy 10,000 of them, right? Because it's such a big run because it's a repeated process. And then you got all this inventory forever. It was a real supply chain challenge and cost of ownership challenge. Right. But now we're finding that actually, hey, material benefits of forgings are really hard to replicate with just printing. So you can imagine yourself if you're thinking about the true optimized thing you want to make, 
And this could end up being spades in space, right? Because they're really big on material properties and life and service because you can't just send a mechanic out. Like a cat, we could just send a welder out in the field. It's going to be a little harder in space. But you can imagine a world where like, hey, I have to have this optimized thing. That's my output of my topology optimization. But I now need an optimized value stream. And my, my hunch is it'll be a little bit of a combo of casting, fabrication techniques, and additive and, for, and things like forging. And that's why we're seeing an interest in robotic forging. And, and, and robotic sometimes casting. blended together, too. Exactly. There's hybrid manufacturing where hybrid. you use one process to do one thing to create a feature of a part, but then it's combined together with another. Part. Absolutely. And we don't really have the appropriate optimization frameworks to actually bring all those together efficiently today, right? So we're either doing one thing or we're just making assumptions and we try it and then we adjust. I don't like that, there's this new technology, we'll just squeeze it in here somewhere. So that's that's obviously like, we talk about making the products of tomorrow. I mean, obviously there's this notion of like bringing together the advancements and additive, the additive community, what's going on in the hammer project. Like these eventually all need to come together, create the value streams of tomorrow to enable more efficient, both high performing products and value streams, right? So we can actually afford to do it here in the US and in Europe and other high cost countries, right? And the fact that they're just not labor, right? I don't know if I was a guidance counselor or if I was recruiting kids to go work in the cat factory I used to work at, hey, who wants to grind on Fab's third shift? Any hands? No, you'd rather build a cool robot app? There we go, right? So anyways, David, I don't mean to interject. It's just a yeah. passion point for me, the convergence of product and process and robotics. Yeah, super I, excited. and I agree. Now, I will say, given my sales pitch, Casting is additive manufacturing. So I talked about making molds and so forth truly with additive. But if you think about it, right, the liquid metal comes in. So we're infinite layer additive manufacturing because that liquid's just going up with inside the part. So I haven't been too successful in that. We're still considered an old technology because we've been around for a while, but it's additive. Any other, was there one other question? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. So I, I might have missed it on a diagram of the cell. I don't know, Roger, you have to know like what the XY is on this guy, like its footprint, uh, or the general reach of that arm, maybe just give a sense of scale. Yeah, 245, so it's got a 28 meter reach, 25 kilogram payload, tilt rotate as a 500 kilogram payload. That's okay. yeah, it's almost a three meter reach on the arm, four meter. Wide, yeah, like three and a half. Yeah, so on the left side or the manipulator side, you know, parts that are like that, a little bit smaller. Um, and then on the other side is, you know, it's a big enough envelope that anything you can bring in there with a pork truck, and again, as long as there's enough reach, you can work on it. We're talking about rolling in a car. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes. Blocking these things. Yeah. Just needing it on part of it. Heavy enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, certainly not, not so much steel castings, but castings in general have been used a lot by the automotive industry. Um, our industry supports a lot of the mining that's needed to get the nickel, the copper, and so forth to uh, support a, an electric vehicle economy. Um, so we've always seen it as as a positive. But yeah, I do think the development and you know again, if you can do these bigger size parts, it's um, not to say that you can't make them with additive or other processes, but they're you know become more challenging to do so. Versus as long as we can get that liquid metal to flow to fill up a mold, there's certainly an opportunity. 